Hello and welcome to this video in which I address the question of whether you should use correlated errors in confirmatory factor analysis and structural equation modeling. My name is Christian Geiser. I'm an instructor and statistical consultant with Quantfish and on this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials. On Tuesdays I usually present a video related to analyses in the m software. On Thursdays I address more general issues in multivariate statistics. If this is something that interests you then please subscribe to this channel. Also don't forget to hit the like button and to check out the description for additional resources including a link to my free weekly statistics newsletter. In this video, I want to discuss the issue of correlated errors in confirmatory factor analysis and structural equation modeling, which is an issue that uh, confuses many people. And so many people have the question of whether they should use correlations between error variables under which situations, whether that has any advantages and disadvantages and so say what is the what would be general guidelines or what are the pros and cons of doing that. Now, let's talk about why you would do this at all. First of all, so what are situations in which you would allow for correlated errors? So one situation is when you use longitudinal data and you, for example, use a longitudinal confirmatory factor analysis model like the one that is shown here or one that could be applied to longitudinal data. So assuming here that we have three measured variables for a given attribute or construct, so this would be Y1, Y2 and Y3, and we measure those indicators repeatedly here on two measurement occasions, so F1 and F2 then represent the error-free scores or latent scores on that attribute that is measured by Y1 through Y3 at two different time points. And so there's a longitudinal confirmatory factor model where F1 and F2 represent the same construct at two time points and they are correlated over time, um, reflecting the, the potential stability of true inter-individual differences across time. Now in such a model, when you use the same indicators repeatedly, what often happens is that when you fit a model like the one that's shown here to your data, it won't fit very well. It'll get, it'll return a chi-square test of model fit that is probably large in terms of the value and highly significant. And so it would indicate that this model doesn't fit well. The reason being that you use the same indicators repeatedly and each indicator often has some amount of specific variance that is not shared with the other indicators, but that is stable across time. So for example, something related to the wording of an item that is unique or something related to the content of an item that is unique and not 100% shared with the other indicators across time. Remember that the common factor here, for example, F1 would reflect Shared, cover shared variability or covariance between the indicators that are measured at the same time point. And so if these indicators have some unique variance that is reliable and stable across time, but not shared with the other indicators, then that would be part or would become part of the error variable epsilon. Now, this isn't a problem in cross-sectional data typically because you measure the indicator only once. And so unless there's another indicator that shares the same uh, spe specificity or uniqueness or something that is um, part of that uniqueness, then you won't have any problems. But when you measure the same indicators repeatedly, then you might see that the error terms, for example, for Y1, might be correlated across time or in other words there might be a residual association between uh, y1 y11 and y12 uh, after accounting for the factors f1 and f2 so after partialing out f1 and f2 there would still be an association and then that isn't modeled unless you 
um, account for that residual association in some way. And so this might show up, for example, in modification indices or in your residual covariance matrix where you might see that there's a large residual covariance between Y11 or Y12 and might be significant. And so the same for Y2 and Y3. And so therefore what people often do in longitudinal data, they allow these error correlations to begin with. So they um, already know this and so they would already specify their longitudinal CFA model with these error covariances included in the model. Another situation might be in cross-sectional data when you have variables of the same factor pertaining to the same factor that are very similar. Let's say you have items that share a lot in common in terms of the wording. There may be um, partially redundant and then that they share some specific variants that they don't share with the other indicators of that factor. Then you might have correlated errors even within the same factor in um, cross-sectional data. Now, the question that I want to address here is should we allow these correlated errors? Why, why not? What are the pros and cons of doing that? So let's start with the pros. And so the pro obviously would be that you would model a source of covariance that otherwise would remain unmodeled um, and then cause misfit. So why is it a problem to have misfit in your model? So let's say if we took those, if we left those out, we fit our model like this and there are these residual associations that are significant. They show up in your residual covariance matrix, standardized residuals. Let's say Z-scores are highly significant for those residual associations in your modification indices. They show up, but you just leave these out. So what could happen? What could happen is that then other parameters of the model that are included might be biased. So for example, here this covariance between F1 and F2 that reflects the stability over time might be inflated if you do not account for that unique stability that would be reflected by these error terms. So in other words, this could create bias because the model will try to accommodate for that residual stability or residual association over time in terms of other parameters that are included in the model. So it's basically you're pushing the model in the wrong direction because the model tries to optimize the fit between um, your observed data and the model implied covariance matrix. When we, for example, use maximum likelihood estimation, we um, would try to maximize the likelihood of the data given the model. And so then the model says, well, if, the, if these are the data um, that you found and this is the model that you think is right, then this co covariance here has to be large uh, to also reflect part of that unique stability and then you might get an incorrect estimate of the stability or correlation between um, the construct over time and so that might be a problem yeah? so you then have you draw wrong conclusions from your model and that's why we are trying to avoid misfit in confirmatory factor analysis and structure equation modeling because we don't know if we have a um, not well fitting model we don't know to which extent parameter estimates might be incorrect. So, and that's an advantage of this approach with the correlated errors is that it makes the misfit go away or it can make that misfit go away. And then if things go well, then this correlation, for example, might be more appropriately estimated. Now, from my perspective, this is about where it ends. Um, the advantages of correlated errors is that you, you get a better fitting model and you might reduce bias. But other than that, I can't think of very many other pros. But I can think of a lot of cons, which is why I prefer not to include correlated error terms in my models if, models, if at all possible. So if I can avoid this, and I'll give you some suggestions later in this video as to how you can, what are alternatives to um, including correlated errors. So what is the first downside that I can think of here? So the first downside is that 
when you allow error terms to correlate then and when those are necessary those correlations then that indicates that there's a reliable source of variance that is not accounted for in the model. And typically what we would like to do, at least as psychometricians, as people um, from a measurement oriented perspective is, we would like to account for all sources of reliable or systematic variance in terms of latent variables, because otherwise that reliable variance does not get represent it and or explain so to say it it becomes confounded with measurement error variance which means then the error variances are inflated they are overestimated and the reliability estimates that can be derived from a model like that will represent underestimates and oftentimes that's something that we like to do with a confirmatory factor model is we like to estimate the reliabilities of our indicators to determine measurement precision. And now if we have correlated errors, then those estimates of the reliabilities will not be correct. They'll typically represent underestimates because then there's a systematic source of variance that is confounded with random measurement error. And that may not be something that we might like. Also, then we cannot separate variance components due to common factor variance versus specific item variance versus um, measurement error variance. And that would be an interesting thing to do from a psychometric perspective. We would like to know to which extent um, do these items have variance in common. So, for example, to, to, or in other words, to which extent do they show convergent validity in measuring a common factor, to which extent do they contain unique variance, and to which extent do they contain random noise or measurement error variance. And so that can be uh, important to know uh, in terms of the homogeneity of a scale if we wanted to find out how homogeneous is our set of items in measuring a common construct or how much specific variance is there in the items. And so one better way to do this would be to include method or indicator specific factors that account for this residual variance. And I have a separate video here on this channel in which I show how you can avoid correlated errors in longitudinal data by including method factors or indicator specific factors. So check out that video if you haven't seen it yet. Um, it's linked below in the description. So that would be one um, aspect would be that we would ideally like to separate all the true score variance from the purely random noise and error variance. And by including correlated errors, we won't be able to do that. Another downside is that when you have longitudinal data with multiple indicators and multiple time points, then this adds a whole bunch of additional parameters to your model, whereas a specification with a method factor tends to be more parsimonious, at least once you have um, many indicators and many time points, because then you can often include constraints in your method factor specification where you save a lot of parameters instead of estimating so many correlated errors, which um, tends to not be parsimonious. Furthermore, when you include all the correlated errors between um, variables that are the same across time, which is recommended by some people. Some people say you have to include them all, otherwise you get into trouble. But then what happens is that uh, almost always some of them aren't statistically significant and or they are close to zero. There are some in there that just simply aren't substantial. And so then the question arises, what do you do with them? Do you then leave them out? How do you interpret that, that some of those aren't significant, others are? Which ones do you retain? Is this a purely empirical issue? Um, should you trim the ones from the model that aren't substantial and so on? So it causes some interpretational issues and that has to do with the fact that usually the indicators aren't randomly selected, at least in uh, the social sciences when we use items, questionnaire items, then all the items are typically structurally distinct and not interchangeable or not randomly selected from a universe of interchangeable items. And so therefore an approach that allows all the correlated errors typically is not 
necessary. So there's typically it would a more parsimonious specification would be sufficient. But then the question is, how would you do that with correlated errors? And it's much easier to do this with method factors where you can select one of the indicators as reference and then contrast that indicator against the other indicators by including residual method factors, as I show in my other video. So that is, and from my perspective, that is a big downside that um, when you have so many correlated errors and then some aren't significant, some are, then how do you interpret that? What interpretation do the common factors have in that under that scenario? And so that causes a that can cause a pretty big mess. So say when you have those correlated errors. Another downside is that this is something that is often done post hoc, so to say. So with longitudinal data, we have good a priori reasons to assume that there will be residual associations when we after we account for the factors over time, because we have the same indicators across time. So we know precisely which of these we would have to admit. So that's pretty clear cut. But in other situations, it's not so clear. For example, in cross sectional data, when you have misfit, then people also often include correlated errors based on a post hoc assessment of misfit by using by looking at a residual covariance matrix or by looking at modification indices and then they just put them in and say oh the modification indices suggested this error correlation and this error correlation and this error correlation so i put them in now i have a good fit and that's also a problem because then those correlated errors are not theory driven, but rather they are empirically driven. They are so say based on post hoc model modifications. And when you do it in this way, then your overall goodness of fit tests are no longer valid, at least not for that same data set, because you explored those modifications based on that data set and you then you can test those. So then the overall chi square after the modifications is no longer something that um, tells you something really about model fit. And so it's therefore to say one other downside of this approach is that um, it tends to be something that people do e as an easy way to fix problems with their model where they say, oh, yeah, it doesn't fit. Um, and this is this is the solution. Let's just put these in. And then it's neither theory driven nor something that you can really test with that same set of data and it often then also is not clear how these correlations are interpreted, which of them really are meaningful and whether you uh, overfit your model perhaps or whether it's the wrong way to improve your model because maybe those correlate or maybe those residual associations are just a symptom of other problems with your model that you should address in a different way rather than just simply including those as a quick fix or symptom um, fix, so to say, of a larger problem. So those are some issues with the correlated errors. And so in summary, I would say there are more downsides than upsides to specifying correlated errors. If you can find a different approach, one approach that often works well is having method or indicator specific factors that represent that source of systematic variance that would otherwise be unaccounted for and become part of the error variable. That tends to be a better approach that leads to more parsimonious specifications oftentimes, and that also leads to a more meaningful interpretation of the results than just simply having those correlated errors. I hope you found this video useful to learn more about the problems associated with specifying correlated errors. If you did, then please subscribe to this channel, hit the like button, leave a comment in the comment section. Maybe you can talk a little bit about your experiences with correlated errors. And don't forget to check out the description for additional resources. And I'll see you next week.